What gives the uh, actuality of my, uh, my, my presentation uh, this evening is that right now, Jobbik, the far-right party in Hungary, is the second most popular political force. It's like that for a few months ago, but uh, they are becoming quite uh, close to the leading uh, party, the governmental party Fidesz. So they have, there is just uh, around 200,000 voters this stands between the current governmental force and, and Jobbik, and right now there are more and more questions about that. Uh, can Jobbik become a governmental force first? If we look at the opinion polls, it doesn't seem something that we can't imagine. And, and second, what would happen if they would uh, go on government? Um, what? Um, this, is, uh, this is about the, the actuality of the topic. Uh, the other actuality is that uh, a book has uh, just been published by Rutledge uh, with the name called uh, Transforming the Transformation, uh, edited by Michael Minkenberg. And this book, uh, where I wrote uh, together with uh, Gregor, uh, my correspondent uh, of several German uh, news outlets uh, of Hungary, uh, we wrote a chapter that is about the Jobbik Fidesz relationship. And what we try to explore in this chapter is that uh, the goal of transforming the transformation to modifying the, the rules of the game that were set uh, in around 1989, 1990 during the transition. So what was the impact in this process of, of Jobbik? the far-right party, and how uh, Fidesz used Jobbik as a pioneer, as a tool, how instrumentalized Jobbik uh, in the process of uh, modifying the institutional system. So, but first, just to setting the stage, a few graphs and, and uh, data about the support of, of uh, Jobbik and Fidesz. Right now, what we can see in the polls is that... Uh, okay is that while uh, the popularity of the governmental party Fidesz is on the decline due to several issues, corruption issues, uh, problems with uh, governance, internal scandals, uh, and a lot more. So a falling popularity of, on the governmental side and the only political force that right now can capitalize on it is Jobbik, the far right uh, party. Uh, the distance between them right now is only 3% among the overall electorate. Jobbik has 18% support, uh, Fidesz has 21% uh, uh, support, which is quite a small uh, gap. And the biggest uh, left-wing opposition force, the Socialist Party, uh, is right now, uh, it, they didn't uh, really seem to capitalize uh, from the uh, popularity full of Fidesz. So right now what we can see is that the only political force that can capitalize on the decline of the support of the government is Jobbik. Um, this is what we can see on a longer run. Uh, the Jobbik support is indicated with blue. What we can see here is that Jobbik right now has uh, its highest support level ever. So they didn't have, uh, they haven't had uh, so many supporters uh, so far. Uh, if we look at the uh, distribution of the Jobbik voters among uh, different uh, sociological groups, what we can see is that uh, among the youngest voters aged between uh, uh, 18 and 30, Jobbik became the first political force with 20% with uh, support by Fidesz has only 16, and also among the unemployed group, which is uh, contrary to the general wisdom, not the uh, traditional stronghold of Jobbik. Uh, the core Jobbik electorate is rather the uh, well-educated, rather well-off uh, youngsters with a middle-class background. But right now what we can see is that the uh, voters who left Fidesz um, uh, mostly from the uh, lower uh, income groups and also some undecided voters and current non-voters who were uh, who didn't vote on the 2014 elections right now uh, turning to 
uh, Jobbik. So they uh, have they have strengthened their positions in the uh, low-income uh, groups as well. And uh, in the uh, level of the small towns, the dif distance between the two parties is also quite uh, small. Uh, so who are the current Jobbik supporters? I think here it's, it's useful to uh, tell a bit about, about the general uh, misconception uh, that is uh, that uh, all the Jobbik voters were former socialist voters. This is a, a theory that, can, that you can hear quite frequently from uh, governmental politicians and pro-governmental uh, analyst institutions and, and think tanks. Uh, the problem is that this is simply not true and it's, it's quite easy to uh, prove via uh, the facts. Even in 2010, according to all the, uh, the 2010 elections, when Jobbik first gained its uh, uh, bigger support uh, with 15% of the votes on the uh, national uh, election, sorry, 17% of the uh, votes on the uh, national election, uh, most of the Jobbik supporters came from uh, former uh, Fidesz supporters and the former non-supporters. And what we can see right now is that uh, Ninety percent of the Jobbik, uh, of voters of Jobbik who voted for Jobbik in April on the last national election are still voters of the Jobbik. While ten percent of the former Fidesz supporters gravitated uh, towards uh, Jobbik, and uh, one tenth of the non-voters in in 2004 would vote for Jobbik as well. And this is something that is, that is quite a dramatic shift. What we can see in Hungary is that the only political force that is really successful in mobilizing the youngsters and mobilizing the non-voters is Jobbik. So this is the uh, force that can channel groups into the politics that were previously inactive uh, politically. And uh, even according to, to uh, a former poll in uh, 2012, November, 18% of Jobbik sympathizers said they voted for Fidesz beforehand and only 5% uh, of them said that they voted for Jobbik. So I think the theory that is the wishful thinking of the Hungarian right uh, that the Jobbik gains its strength uh, on the basis of the uh, socialist supporters is simply uh, not true. And if we just see on this graph, I think it's pretty easy to see. Of course, it's just an indirect proof, not a direct proof, but when Jobbik loses, uh, when Fidesz loses support, it's mainly Jobbik who can capitalize on that, which is also, uh, it, it also makes highly unlikely that, that uh, all the Jobbik voters are, are previous uh, socialist voters. And uh, even right now, what we can see is that uh, uh, Jobbik still has quite big room for maneuvering. The, the uh, uh, former taboos that were um, set by the voters and the parties uh, against voting for uh, Jobbik has right now collapsed. Uh, what we can see is that uh, most of the... Uh, Jobbik uh, doesn't have stronger rejection figures uh, according to the polls than, than uh, the rest of the parties, and they still have a lot of possible supporters. 4% of the overall electorate would uh, vote for Jobbik the, according to their second party preferences, and three-fourths of this group is a Fidesz supporter at the moment. Half of this group is currently uh, quite dissatisfied with the state of affairs and even the the performance of the government. So what we can see again is that the biggest shift or the biggest transfer is between voters of Jobbik and voters of, of Fidesz. If we look at the party preferences, if we, if we secondary party preferences, the party rejections, the picture is quite clear. On the other hand, uh, Jobbik can be successful in even targeting the voters, uh, the right now undecided voters who would otherwise uh, vote for the socialists. But as the, what we can see right now is that as the uh, anti-governmental sentiments are becoming stronger and stronger, uh, voters want to find the most competent, the strongest uh, party that has the biggest chance to defeat 
uh, Fidesz, uh, for example, on, on, um, uh, on the interim elections uh, that we can see. So, in short, uh, Jobbik uh, can capitalize even on the decline of the uh, support of, of Fidesz, the governmental party, and even on the weakness of the socialist party and even the overall left-wing opposition camp that is highly divided, uh, unable to uh, express its, its uh, political uh, ideology and, and even its, its political principles and not really successful in, in, uh, in uh, capitalizing on the uh, popularity trust of, of uh, Jobbik. Recently, uh, recently, the leader of the Jobbik gave an interview in uh, in a right-wing daily, uh, Magyar Nemzet in Beach, uh, he said that uh, they would be, uh, they would be, af he would personally be afraid to govern because of uh, that. Uh, Jobbik has not prepared so much for governance, but he feels that the pressure is stronger and stronger, and he wants to prepare his party for uh, governance. Uh, this process began much. Uh, uh, so a long time ago, around two years ago, when uh, Jobbik decided to launch a campaign in which they uh, modified their image from an extremist party to a moderate uh, centrist uh, party, uh, the party of the youngsters. And uh, this uh, campaign was pretty successful so far. We could see on the graphs that, that Jobbik's support has more than doubled uh, uh, partially as a consequence of, of uh, this campaign, and uh, it can even uh, grow further. Um, the interesting thing is uh, why Jobbik is be becoming uh, stronger and stronger, uh, still the uh, governmental party Fidesz doesn't seem to be concerned in the sense that we know from background information that they are quite concerned. On the other hand, they still haven't launched a full-scale political attack against their biggest rivals. Why they, uh, day by day, uh, uh, blaming the socialist and the former uh, and the current left-wing uh, political forces who are uh, who pose a much smaller threat to their current electoral uh, support uh, for being responsible for all the negative things uh, for the country. And what is the reason for that? I think the reason is, is uh, twofold. Uh, first of all, uh, it's quite difficult to, to target a party, to attack a party that is not really uh, distant to you, distant to you ideologically. Uh, Jobbik in the uh, Fidesz in the last years ha didn't uh, dedicated any effort to weaken Jobbik's support for the simple reason that they could feel that they capitalize on the presence of Jobbik. Because while Jobbik seems to pose a threat, and they really pose a threat on the right-wing electorate and even Fidesz voters, uh, gaining a two-thirds again in 2014 wouldn't have been uh, possible without a divided opposition, divided even in the sense that Jobbik ha Fidesz has two-sided opposition, uh, one side on the left and one side uh, on the uh, extreme right. Uh, this is one thing. The other thing is I think, especially in the former uh, period, uh, Fidesz, instead of just trying to suck away the voters of, of uh, Jobbik, uh, tried to implement some of Jobbik's policies. And the reason for that, uh, contrary to the general analysis, the general opinion that is uh, uh, appears everywhere. Uh, I think the main reason for that is not that they were just afraid that their voters, Fidesz voters, will go to the far right if they don't implement their policies. But I think the main reason is that Orban uh, simply wanted to go into the direction that, that Jobbik set in a, in a lot of issues. Not all of the issues, but uh, let's come back to it a bit later. Uh, 
So uh, there is there is a widespread um, dissatisfaction with the state of the. Uh, political affairs and even the transformation in Hungary. Uh, according to a poll in a uh, poll conducted by Pew Research Center in 2009, and uh, we can compare the results from 1991, Hungary is uh, one of the countries where the people are the most satisfied with the state of affairs as a, as a result of the uh, transition. The approval of change to democracy and capitalism uh, declined uh, significantly with 18 uh, uh, percentage points uh, from 1990 uh, until 2009. And uh, among the V4 countries, uh, the, the uh, perception of the change to democracy is the worst. If we look at the economic side, it's even worse. In 1991, 80% uh, approved the change to market economy, so rather were rather optimistic about the uh, transition. But in 2009, this figure uh, by 2009, this figure dropped significantly, uh, with uh, 46 to 46 percent. And this is uh, after Ukraine, the lowest uh, in uh, Central Eastern Europe, according to the uh, poll countries. Uh, why is it important? For two reasons. One is that 2009 was the year when Jobbik made his first electoral success on the EP elections with almost 15% of the votes, which was a huge surprise. Uh, according to most, most of the polls uh, predicted 5 to 10 percent or, or even less, so it was a big surprise. It was, it was the year when uh, the uh, after uh, after a change on the government, a still quite unpopular uh, socialist uh, liberal government was uh, governing and Jobbik was quite successful in, uh, in articulating the discontent and, and making, uh, making political success out of the, out of the general uh, negative uh, or bad public uh, morale. The second thing is that in Hungary, especially on the right wing, right uh, side of the uh, spectrum, but even on the left side, everyone wants to capitalize on the negative sentiments uh, towards the transition, towards the market capitalism, and even uh, towards, the, uh, towards democracy in, in uh, general. What uh, a scholar described the buyer's remorse it's pretty widespread in, in Hungary, is that this is not something we wanted. And of course, we shouldn't just downplay all this opinion as, as mere perception. Of course, we can see a, a lot of uh, sociological problems that were accelerated or, or deepened uh, as, as a consequence of the transition, deepening poverty, uh, for example, and, and growing uh, inequality to, to a level that is not really uh, preferred by the public and, and uh, a lot more issues. But uh, what became quite general as a result of this negative perception of the transformation is that uh, the so-called myth of so stolen transition has become quite widespread, especially on the right wing of the political scene. What is the myth of, of uh, stolen uh, transition? For those who come from Eastern Europe, I think this is a, a theory that can be quite familiar. This is that uh, the transition as such has, uh, haven't, uh, didn't really happen. It was just the post-communist elites uh, and the communist elites with the bankers, with the uh, international uh, um, financial groups with the cooperation of, of some secret services of the United States, of, of uh, Israel in the, in the uh, anti-Zionist readings and so on, have made their deals and what we can see right now is not a real democracy, is not a real uh, market economy, this is just, uh, this, this is just a play. Uh, a play of the politicians and, and of the, of the uh, even stronger people uh, behind them. And the myth of the stolen transition has become something that is, I think, uh, the, was the most important driving force 
uh, of policy or, or the myth of the to stolen transition and the sentiments behind them. So the general negative uh, sentiments towards the system as such became the most important transformative force by uh, uh, 2010 in Hungary. Uh, this is a campaign, um, a campaign billboard of uh, Jobbik from 2010. It says, 20 years for 20 years. This is the public's, public's verdict, 20 years for 20 years. It was in 2010, uh, 20 years, the first 20 years means uh, 20 years after the transition, the second means uh, uh, 20 years in prison. So all the ones who were participated in the post-transitional uh, political elite uh, should send to jail and uh, this is uh, simplifying a bit the message, but the message in it originally was not really uh, complex neither. And uh, it was, and the slogan as well is that the, the uh, pure force, with, with pure force. Uh, so this is uh, beside uh, anti-gypsy sentiments, the anti-political, anti-establishment sentiments were the one that uh, Yobi could exploit uh, most successfully via the election campaign, and I think this is the two main factors that Yobi can uh, uh, could capitalize on, and, and that could uh, Yobi could gain its uh, popularity on the basis on. On the other hand, it was not just Jobbik that uh, played on these sentiments. Even beforehand, we could see that the dissatisfaction with the market economy and democracy. Uh, uh, produce spectacular results on elections. In 1994, when uh, the socialists, uh, um, let's say, returned to power because then it was really uh, a party. Right now it's still a post-communist party, the socialist party, but then, uh, back then it was, let's say, 90% composed of uh, politicians who were active in the, uh, in the state socialist system before the transition. So in 1994, when after four years of quite unpopular government with all the, uh, all the differences uh, and sufferings uh, of the transition, the socialists could return into the power because the nostalgia towards the uh, state socialism has increased. We can obviously see in the polls. And uh, in Hungary, this is a very, very dangerous uh, sentiment uh, for the reason that uh, before the transition, let's say in the, especially the last decade, but the last two decades before the transition were the uh, years of the so-called goulash communism, which was that in Hungary, the uh, state socialism was a bit, Less, much uh, less repressive and, and, the, uh, and we're providing a stronger, uh, higher living standard than for most of the countries in the post-communist region. Therefore, when people feel uh, some problems with the current state of affairs, the, the uh, quite uh, automatic uh, reaction to that is that nostalgia towards the state socialist uh, system arises. And then uh, Jobbik exploited this and other parties exploited this, this uh, anti-establishment sentiments, they could also build on this uh, uh, post-communist nostalgia. Uh, Fidesz's claims, on the other hand, were even before the 2010 election, when they returned to power, and even in 2000, after that, is that they do a second transition. First, uh, the Prime Minister also said that this is the correction of the transition, what goes on. And he also uh, labeled his achievements as revolution on the ballot boxes. Uh, with the two-thirds majority of Fidesz uh, in 2010, uh, Fidesz was able to transform practically the overall uh, institutional system in a way that strongly benefits their uh, political and economic interests with uh, cementing uh, uh, people into the positions of the so-called, to the heads of the so-called independent institutions with uh, modifying the constitution without any referendum or, or uh, uh, something changing the electoral system, uh, uh, making a stronger media uh, 
supervisory body, uh, changing the constitutional court and, and practically switching it off while it was beforehand the most important uh, counterbalance to, to governments and so on and so on. I think you know a lot of details about it, don't have, uh, I don't have to uh, uh, go into them. And what made it quite uh, easy for Fidesz is that, uh, is that nobody was really liking the institutions that were set up in, uh, during the transition. So the public trust towards the establishment and its institutions was so low that it made it uh, really easy to uh, transform the uh, system. Uh, on this, sorry, I didn't translate it. Uh, this is the 10 promises, 10, 10 electoral promises of Jobbik from 2010. Uh, what we can see is that uh, quite a lot of uh, promises by Jobbik were implemented uh, by Fidesz. By these 10 promises, practically eight of them were, were implemented by Fidesz. Not all of them, we can say, are typically extremist uh, uh, measures such as, let's say, let's reduce the, the utility prices. This is not something that you can call as an essentially uh, uh, far-right uh, policy, but uh, generally the, uh, this policy package, which is about that uh, law and order policies, which is about public work instead of, of uh, social benefits, which is about uh, uh, putting extra taxes on multinational companies, uh, which is uh, also about uh, 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 giving dual citizenship to ethnic Hungarians. So it's a package that contains anti-capitalist elements, nationalist uh, symbolic elements, and uh, uh, also a very strong uh, law and order dimension. This is quite a coherent package. And most of these measures that were pro uh, promised by, by Jobbik were implemented uh, by Fidesz in between 2010 and 2014. Uh, we can see uh, convergences between uh, Jobbik and Fidesz policies in several dimensions. Uh, for example, just a quite recent uh, example is that the government launched a campaign. Right now they, are, they don't do it that uh, loudly, but they did it for about a month uh, against the so-called economic migrants. Uh, the sad thing is that no economic migrants want to come to Hungary. They all want to go to to other countries such as Austria, such as Germany, uh, such as uh, uh, United Kingdom and elsewhere. But the government, uh, because there was a real uh, rise in the number of the migrants uh, uh, coming from Kosovo, they launched the campaign against the migrants, trying to exploit the strong anti uh, immigrant uh, xenophobic sentiments on the public. It was, I think, quite fortunately, highly unsuccessful so far for the very reason that it's true that the Hungarian population is quite str strongly xenophobic, but uh, the uh, issue of migration is simply a non-issue. Uh, according to a Eurobarometer poll, 3% of the Hungarian population thinks that migration, emigration, uh, sorry, immigration is an important issue. In, in uh, countries of, of Western Europe, this figure is about 60-70%. Uh, so I think in the countries where there are uh, just a very small uh, number of immigrants, it's highly uh, difficult to launch a successful anti-immigrant campaign. And this is what the uh, government bad, met. But it was uh, also something that in this uh, rude and crude form, how the, how the uh, government used, the prime minister said, for example, that we should slam the door before all the economic immigrants. While even in the uh, Jobbik, uh, uh, among Jobbik's MPs in the previous term, there was one doctor, for example, who, who uh, had uh, an immigrant background, who worked as a, uh, uh, as a doctor for decades and came here for a better life, so economic migrants. So it was, uh, it was not a really credible campaign and even not, was not a really successful campaign. But we can see several other things, uh, uh, dual citizenship, 
trial and commemoration day. It was also uh, issues that were raised by Jobbik uh, and implemented by uh, Fidesz, Eastern opening. Generally, uh, in the first term of the uh, governance, and even previously, uh, yes, between 1998 and 2002, when Orban was first on power, uh, his government was a strongly EU, uh, Euro-Atlantic government with, uh, with all the leaders of the diplomacy uh, wanted to strengthen the ties with the EU and with uh, the United States, and they were even uh, successful in that. So Eastern opening, opening to Russia, to uh, Azerbaijan, to Turkey, to Turkmenistan, and a lot of other countries was not uh, originally and essentially part of uh, uh, of Fidesz's politics, it was uh, rather uh, set up and used as, as an official policy after they uh, became a governmental force in 2010. While from the very beginning it was the most important uh, uh, priority for Jobbik. Uh, even in uh, interviews around 2006-2007, Jobbik leaders said that there are three most important countries that we should open to. Uh, Russia, Turkey, and Germany. Uh, Vona says right now the same, that these are the three countries that we have to open to. And right now the government says literally the same. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, Orban mentioned recently these three countries as the most uh, crucial countries to focus on in our uh, foreign policy uh, strategy. Energy policy, an energy policy that is strongly based on fossils and, and uh, nuclear power uh, with, a, uh, with a strong dependence from Russian sources. This, is, this was also essentially uh, essential part of Jobbik's uh, policy. Employment policy, the uh, public work instead of the state benefits. It was something that was raised by Jobbik much before it was appeared in, in uh, Fidesz politics. And law and order uh, rhetorics with a lot of, of its uh, consequences. It, it, was, it is also, also something that, that uh, Jobbik used in a quite racist framing against the gypsy crime. The government used it uh, in a different framing without uh, such direct reference to uh, to uh, to gypsies, but but uh, with uh, raising uh, sen similar sentiments. And at this point, I think I uh, we even have to clarify. But while we can see a lot of similarities and more and more similarities between Jobbik and uh, Fidesz's politics, for the reason that uh, Fidesz in the last years have rather rather radicalized its rhetoric, while Jobbik is trying to shift towards the center, at least uh, uh, on the surface, there are still uh, uh, very important differences between the two parties as well, and we shouldn't draw a complete equal line between the two. And I think this too is uh, that uh, Fidesz was never such an openly anti-Gypsy and anti-Semitic party that uh, Jobbik is still is. Why the leaders of the Jobbik uh, claiming that we are not a racist, not an anti-Semitic party, every day you can uh, hear uh, voices from uh, the lower levels of the party about Holocaust denial, about killing the gypsies, about uh, horrible things, and these are the, every, these are the typical voices from, from Jobbik. And uh, I think uh, in Fidesz, this open racism and open anti-Semitism has never existed, and this is still a very important uh, division line. But let's see, okay, we can claim that this is quite logical. Uh, Fidesz is afraid of losing the popularity of the public, and especially losing the popularity of their own voters. Therefore, as let's say Nicolas Sarkozy did beforehand, they try to adapt some of the more acceptable uh, policies of the far right in order to uh, channel the voters in the, uh, their camp. Let's see the success of the strategy. So, Fidesz is losing support, Jobbik is on the rise. Can we say that it was a successful electoral strategy? Not so much, I think. Uh, generally, I think the, the uh, strategy of, of Fidesz to implementing some of the measures of, of Jobbik was uh, talking in electoral terms was highly 
uh, unsuccessful. And uh, hopefully if it has to be recognized it as well. But I think there is even another uh, uh, explanation for why uh, Jobbik, uh, why Fidesz did that. And I think it is about what, what uh, Viktor Orban described this in his infamous uh, uh, speech last uh, summer, uh, when he said that uh, in Hungary, a neoliberal sta state should be set up, and uh, the, this illiberal state uh, respect to, the, to a given extent the individual freedoms, but are not based on the principle of human rights. And what he even said is that uh, it was after the, the second victory of, of Jobbik uh, last uh, summer. What he even said is that the uh, liberalism and free market capitalism has failed to provide better living circumstances for the people in general. Therefore, we need to set, uh, we need to uh, uh, change the fundamentals of the system and set uh, the, the uh, basis of the system on, on different uh, principles. And these different principles are not uh, human rights as such and, and liberalism and individual, but rather the nation, uh, Christianity, and, uh, and the family. Uh, and I think these are, this was a speech that I think we're much, uh, quite talkative in the sense that uh, it was the first speech in which Orban, let's say the second speech, there was one before the 2010 election as well, but in not that open way. So in this uh, speech he quite openly uh, explained and referring uh, to countries as models such as Russia and Turkey that he wants uh, to completely change the system in Hungary in a direction that is essentially illiberal. And this kind of uh, direction is the direction uh, that uh, Jobbik uh, promised to uh, bring the country even a lot of years ago. I think what we could see in the 2010 2014 term, I think right now we have a different story and, and uh, I don't want to go into details, but r right now this picture has changed, but uh, instead of, of being afraid of, Fidesz being, were being afraid of Jobbik, they rather utilized Jobbik, uh, instrumentalized them as a pioneer. Uh, Jobbik was the pioneer that opened the uh, room and, and the space for new uh, policy strategies and solutions that were practically proved was quite uh, atypical. The Eastern opening is a, is a typical thing. Uh, before Jobbik, nobody was talking in such an open way about the necessity of uh, open the country towards Russia and, and all the Eastern countries. They did it, therefore, when Fidesz uh, uh, implemented these policies, it was not that unfamiliar unfamiliar uh, anymore, even in, in nationalism, even in transforming the uh, institution, even in, in breaking some of the former taboos of market capitalism, such as yeah, equal chances to companies and, and uh, freedom and all these things. These were uh, uh, directions that uh, Jobbik, uh, these, were, these were fields where Job, that Jobbik explored much before uh, Fidesz could did it, and I think uh, Fidesz as a governmental party could capitalize on the situation that they can achieve uh, most of the goals of their illiberal strategy that they wanted to achieve, why they don't seem to be extreme, because there is a party that is uh, echoing similar voices but in much more extreme form, and, and uh, this is uh, your big. Therefore, I think uh, while in the first period Jobbik's uh, policy seems to be a high success. Uh, Jobbik's politicians were also uh, 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 also mentioning several times that it was Fidesz that implemented their uh, policies. I think it was rather the victory of Fidesz in the sense that they could uh, uh, achieve their goals with using uh, Jobbik as an instrument in this regard. And I think this is maybe a moment to stop and uh, any questions are, are welcome, and, and if you have questions about the uh, here and now, uh, more details about the moderate shift and, and so on, I'm happy to answer to them. Thank you very much. <laughs>